Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Schlissel. I'm the university president. I'm now here in my seventh year. Uh, uh, as I said, thanks for joining us today. Uh, and thank you for sending uh, your children to the University of Michigan. I'm always amazed at how uh, uh, talented, enthusiastic, and committed uh, our students are. Uh, please note, uh, as you see, we have American Sign Language uh, translation in real time, uh, and a recording of today's uh, session will be posted later uh, in case you're unable to stay the whole time or want to refer, refer to your, your friends. Uh, you can submit questions to us during this session uh, using the Q&A feature uh, on Zoom, and we'll be ending around three in the afternoon. Uh, so we have a lot to cover today, and we'd like to get to as many questions as well as possible. I'm joined today by Provost Susan Collins, uh, who's our Chief Academic Officer, uh, Vice President for Student Life, Martino Harmon, and our Chief Campus Health Officer, Dr. Preeti Malani, both a physician, an alumna, and a Michigan parent. Uh, so as I'm sure many of you know, earlier today, we laid out our plans for the winter semester here on the Ann Arbor campus. And before I talk about the plans, I wanna give you a little bit of context. Uh, the spread of COVID-19 right now is higher than at any time during the pandemic. And that spread is here in Michigan, as well as most states around our country. Uh, two days ago, we set a record with 121,000 cases in the United States, and Michigan had 5,710 cases. Uh, the rate of new cases is increasing in a dramatic fashion, far faster than when the pandemic first started. The spread's happening amongst all age groups. It's not just young people as it was a couple of months ago, it's all age groups. Hospitals are once again filling up with COVID-19 patients, placing a strain on overall healthcare uh, here and throughout the nation. Uh, although our classrooms and campus facilities have been safe this fall semester, our experience uh, has resulted in an unacceptable level of spread amongst our undergraduate students both on campus and off, that got to a level a couple of weeks ago that actually threatened our public health capacity to control that spread. Uh, so far this semester, we've had slightly over 1,500 COVID-19 cases amongst our, our students, with more than 500 of those uh, being in the residence halls. Uh, although uh, we, uh, um, the disease is not uh, as severe in young people as it is in older people, it's still a serious illness. It can be debilitating and its effects can be long lasting. So it's not to be trifled with. Uh, also, we did not get uniform cooperation with case investigation, isolation and quarantine. Uh, some students would not speak to case investigators and others are found to be holding parties while in quarantine. That's simply not acceptable. We're heading into the winter. It's the usual peak season for the spread of cold viruses and, and other diseases like influenza. Uh, and they combine to place an even greater strength on our healthcare system. Uh, all of those reasons uh, are ones why uh, we've planned for a different kind of semester than the fall semester. Uh, the disease is different and it's spreading more rapidly. Uh, our uh, plans uh, reflect a tremendous amount of feedback and engagement that came from throughout our community. Uh, we surveyed uh, your students, your, your children, uh, we surveyed faculty and staff. Uh, there's a broad array of different views on what the ideal semester looks like for the University of Michigan. And that's not a surprise given the diversity of our campus. Uh, what our plans seek to do is to help students advance on their academic goals uh, with new measures to address key problems. Uh, there's no playbook for this. Uh, we have to use the data. Uh, we have to use our expertise our values and our best judgments, trying to help everybody make it through this very challenging time as successfully as possible and with their good health maintained. Uh, safety remains an utmost concern throughout our community. Testing of course is an important tool that we need to deploy more aggressively and make it easier to access requiring testing for some in our community. As I mentioned a minute ago, we know that cold and flu season, colder weather and something we're calling COVID fatigue present very real challenges for us in the coming semester. That's why we've revamped our testing regimen. We will further reduce campus density and provide more options for remote learning. This will make it easier to comply with public health guidelines and ease pressure on quarantine and isolation housing and contact tracing. 
The key elements of our plan for the winter include the following. Only classes that must be taught in person will be done so as determined by instructors and program leaders. No instructors will be required to teach in person if they choose not to. Uh, these plans emphasize the academic mission. We wanna ensure that all of our students and faculty can continue to advance their academic goals in as many ways as possible, and that students continue their progress to complete their Michigan degrees. We're gonna focus on making the highest quality education possible under these circumstances. We're gonna require entry testing for the virus for key groups in our community when they return in January, including those living in residence halls and those who teach in person. We'll also require weekly testing for undergraduates in the resident halls and undergraduate students who live in town but are participating in on-campus activities. Further, we'll make testing available weekly for any students who wants to be tested. To reduce the density in our residence halls, Undergraduate students who don't need to live in the residence halls should remain at their permanent residences for the semester. We'll continue to provide a safe place to live for a small number of students in our residence halls, particularly those for whom U of M is their home or who need to be on campus for health and safety reasons, or because they have a required curricula with in-person courses or other extraordinary extenuating circumstances. I also encourage students who live off campus to study remotely this coming semester from their permanent home, unless their academic programs require them to be back on campus. I'm gonna turn things over now to Provost Collins who will discuss more about our instructional plan and how the semester will play out. Uh, Provost Collins. Uh, great, thank you very much, President Fussell. And to all of the parents who are here uh, this afternoon, we're, we're so pleased that you joined us uh, on today's virtual town hall and um, delighted to, to have your students as well as part of the University of Michigan community. Um, as you know, we've just announced our plans for winter 21 and my remar remarks will focus on the academic portion of that. Our top priorities remain the safety of faculty, staff, and students, as well as our commitment to delivering the best quality academic programs that we can for our students, given the very challenging context. Our shared goal continues to be teaching that enables our students to really dig deeply into their studies and develop the critical thinking and other skills that will help them to succeed and to thrive. Um, you know, as, as, as already mentioned, um, there's so many important considerations to balance as we developed our plans and um, reasonable people will weigh those considerations very differently and will have had different experiences and will reach different conclusions. Um, focusing on our shared goals and the work that we can do together to support our students, our faculty and our staff in the months ahead is really been fundamental to uh, developing our plan. So those plans were crafted from extensive reviews of the experience, including surveys of students and faculty. We received many direct communications and petitions from faculty groups, students and from parents. And we thought about and uh, reviewed uh, that information and those inputs uh, very carefully. And we continue, of course, to monitor the public health and other available data as well. And I'll stress that uh, classes on campus have been safe. All of the, the changes that we made to minimize risk have worked well, and there's been limited spread uh, and evidence of virus transmission in those classroom settings. But the instructional experience has also been very stressful for many. And we uh, heard that very clearly from a variety of surveys and, and inputs. Uh, and as mentioned, the public health considerations point to a very challenging winter with a need for prudence. So, uh, you know, it's clear then that um, we need to balance those considerations. So for winter 2021, we're continuing with the instructional method, the approach that we've been implementing in the very recent weeks with most classes that are taught remotely and those in-person classes limited to the ones that are most effectively taught in person or required to be taught in person. Um, and instructors working with the leaders of their programs will select the formats that they believe are the most appropriate and make that information available to our students before registration. Um, given the very extensive feedback that we've received, we do anticipate fewer hybrid classes, the ones that have some students in, uh, 
remotely and some students who are in person. Um, and we'll be supporting and working with our faculty on the wide variety of different modalities. What we've also learned that there are significant differences across the programs in the schools and colleges. And so we would expect that to continue to be true in winter 21. Our plan is not a one size fits all, but it recognizes the differences uh, across our programs, which will result in some variation with some programs remaining largely remote and others offering the limited in-person instruction uh, that I mentioned that enable students to continue and progress towards their academic goals. Our students have asked for some breaks in the calendar to give them a bit of breathing room. Um, the going straight through has been quite challenging. And so we've adjusted the schedule for the winter semester to add in two break days, Wednesday, February 24th and Tuesday, March 23rd. We'll still start classes on January 19th, right after Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and we'll end at the same date that we initially scheduled but there'll be no classes on those break days. And we look forward to working with our students and our faculty to create some voluntary activities and ways for us to engage together that will be fun and safe and help to, uh, to um, develop our community. Many of our students and faculty have also described a heavier workload this fall. There seem to be many reasons for this. And so we're really working to engage with our instructors to ensure that efforts to keep students actively involved in remote classes are thoughtful and balanced and address some of those considerations. I'd also like to mention some of the things that we learned since our pivot to remote instruction last fall and the experiences that we've had this, this uh, I mean, last, uh, last winter and the experiences that we've had this fall. Um, there have clearly are a number of positive features and faculty are drawing on the, that information as they plan their coursework, their courses for next semester. And I'd like to share just a few of those. One of the silver linings has been the expanded opportunity to bring in perspectives of a range of outside speakers, which increases students' exposure to ideas and approaches to understanding what they're studying and, um, and different points of view. Another comes from the opportunities to combine asynchronous lectures with synchronous active learning sessions, allowing students to reflect on the lectures before posing questions, to listen to lectures again after discussing them with their classmates and with their instructors. And there are a number of those features that really enhance learning and, uh, and that uh, enrich uh, the classroom environment. We're also using and exploring new approaches to evaluating students. For instance, using different types of low stakes learning assessments and coupling those with fewer high stakes assessments. And that can help to decrease stress and provide faculty with useful feedback as well uh, in engaging in different modalities. And then finally, I'll note that the virtual office hours can be a plus. Um, students report that online office hours are easier, they're more comfortable and they're more convenient and make some students engage and more likely to attend. Um, many of our students like the collaborative capstone projects that faculty are initiating uh, that enable them to blend autonomy and accountability and work in different groups in different ways with our faculty. And so there are a variety of those uh, innovative approaches to teaching that we're excited about and will continue to use and to enhance uh, with our curriculum. So it's been a very complex semester. It's certainly not the college experience any one of us would have hoped for. Um, and we're very proud of our students in that context, their dedication, their creativity, and frankly, their hard work. So during the rest of this term and beyond, we'll continue working on ways to improve the experience and to enhance wellness within our community. And when appropriate, we look forward to exploring ways to increase safe in-person opportunities for our students as well. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Susan. Uh, Vice President Harmon. Thank you, President Shalisso. Uh, first of all, I wanna say thank you for joining us today and uh, what is certainly an unprecedented parents and family weekend. And I wanna echo the thanks for allowing your student to join the Wolverine family. I'm new to the Wolverine family myself and I understand normally we would be gathering on campus for a student uh, life tailgate and headed over to the big house for a football game. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to the time when we can actually do that. And I'm sad to miss on all of that. Um, now I'd like to share some important announcements and reminders for you about uh, from student life. 
First, I wanna remind you to schedule their, uh, your students' departure testing, which is part of the housing exit process this year. Prior to returning home for the fall, it's really important to complete these steps to keep the student and your family safe. This is required of all residential students, but we also encourage off-campus students to get a test uh, before leaving. And there, uh, we have lots of information about traveling safety and exit protocols. Please ensure students plan enough time to receive a test prior to departing. Allow for approximately three days to receive the test results before actually traveling. All housing students have been offered weekly testing for the past three weeks, and this will continue to be available next week uh, for them to receive departure testing. And we'll be sending an announcement soon that will include test locations and times for each building. Please also keep in mind some really important guidelines. Two weeks of social distancing prior to travel is recommended. Two weeks of quarantine and, and after arriving home is strongly recommended. I know it's hard, you wanna spend lots of time with them right away, but just make sure you save some Thanksgiving dinner for them. Uh, for more important tra uh, travel guidelines, uh, you can uh, look at our uh, information on traveling safety uh, pointers, which are available under the departure testing protocol section of the Campus Maze and Blue print website. We'll announce plans for Parents and Family Weekend 2021 during the winter term. So please stay tuned at parents.umich.edu. That's parents.umich.edu for that announcement. Before I outline key points for winter 2021 with respect to housing, dining, and other student life related plans, I wanna take a moment to thank all the students, parents, and families who provided frank and helpful feedback on their experiences this fall. Our decisions on how to move forward definitely weren't made lightly. The pandemic has made it challenging to deliver the college experience we really want for our UM students and the experience that they deserve and expect. We recognize that the experience during the pandemic has been challenging and a sacrifice for everyone involved, students, families, uh, faculty, and staff. I look forward uh, to when we can get back to a full normal rhythm in, this, in the long run, but for now, here's our plan for keeping our students and the families safe for next semester. As President Schlissel said, every undergraduate student who is able, we are strongly encouraging you to remain at home at your permanent residence during winter 21. This will allow us to reduce density in our residence halls and throughout campus. Graduate students may remain. We've found an extremely limited spread with this population of cases. We are releasing all undergraduate students from their winter housing contracts with no penalty uh, and no, uh, no charge or, or penalty. Undergraduate students must reapply if you want to opt to stay in university housing for next semester. Uh, as President Solicio said, this will be based on a number of uh, factors and needs. We have limited capacity for single occupancy, which is what we will offer. And we wanna provide housing for students who need it. And that would include students who call University of Michigan home and must remain on campus for personal well-being, health and safety, and uh, other reasons that may be critically important. We'll also provide housing for RAs, uh, undergraduate international students who cannot return home, and students with financial, academic, or various, very housing related challenges and other extenuating circumstances. We, we will provide housing again for our rest staff members, which include RAs and diversity peer educators. Detailed information on the process for reapplying, the move out process um, and other important information will be uh, uh, sent from the housing office very, very soon. And it will be sent to all undergraduate students currently residing in residence halls. I wanna mention that I recognize that these changes may be unsettling for many students and families during what is already a challenging semester. We will take great care and concern during this transition to provide the support and assistance that is necessary. I wanna speak a little bit about the rationale for reducing density in the residence halls. It really follows public health guidance on offering single occupancy rooms as many of the cases that we found 
during the fall were roommate um, transmissions and also de-densifying the halls. Uh, factors in public health guidelines indicating that um, really the public health experts have recommended that the higher density in, in the halls really increases the risk of spread. It also eases the burden on our quarantine and isolation housing. By decreasing the density, it gives us opportunities to potentially increase the number of spaces in quarantine and isolation housing. We've also heard extensively from RAs and student residents that we need to lower the resident to RA ratio. And that provides more support and more safe engagement. When we think about enforcement for winter semester, it's really important for students who do remain to know that we're gonna em emphasize a strict enforcement of our policies related to safety and, uh, and keeping the community well. While many of our students complied with guidelines throughout the fall, we've had, we've been, they've been practicing the Wolverine culture of care and making good choices, but other students have put themselves and the community at risk by making bad choices. We all get how challenging this is though. It's not lost on me as an educator and a student affairs professional how problematic this paradox is. Having to penalize students for attempting to engage in social behavior that is normal and healthy in, for their developmental stages is really a challenge. Yet safety has to be our number one priority. We'll be incorporating mandatory weekly testing for our undergraduate residents, uh, which will, we will believe will help us track and curb the spread of COVID. But we will also instill a stronger set of expectations and shared responsibility to make sure that students comply with the weekly testing. The effectiveness of this approach is demonstrated on other campuses and we'll have the testing capacity to do this on a de-densified campus in the winter. Dining, our dining program will remain the same as it was in the fall with grab and go options, many uh, delicious meals. And I talked to, to several students during the fall that really did enjoy the meals. Uh, so we will stay with that plan for the fall or the winter term. University unions will remain open with reduced hours and recreation sports will remain open with the same safety guidelines that was used during the fall. This is really an important part of health and wellness the students having the ability to exercise and to stay fit. In closing, I wanna reiterate that these plans for winter semester are informed by our commitment to safety for the community. It's also informed by the feedback we received from you, from students, from faculty and staff, balanced with the guidance from our public health experts. Thank you again for joining us today. Take care and stay well. Uh, thanks, Martino. Before handing things over to Preeti, I wanna thank some folks who are behind the scenes that are actually doing a lot of the work for this virtual parents weekend. Uh, many of you know they're from the Dean of Students office, uh, Dean of Students, Laura Blake Jones, and her colleagues, Sarah, Sarah Daniels and Angela Bauer. So I'd like to say a thank you to them. And, and also to our uh, parents and students, you know, we recognize this is not, not ideal. This isn't the freshman experience or the upper class experience that your uh, uh, students uh, chose the University of Michigan for. Uh, this is uh, based on our concerns about the whole community safety, uh, your children's safety, your family's safety, and trying to strike the right balance, assure they continue their education. We recognize the disruption. We apologize for it. Uh, we're gonna try to get the university back to normal just as soon as perhaps a new vaccine or other advances allow us to do that. Uh, and until then, you know, we're grateful that you stick with us and that you work with your students to help them get as much out of their university experience as they possibly can uh, in the current circumstances. So let me turn things over to Dr. Milani. Thanks. Uh, I will refer everyone to the Maze and Blueprint site for the latest information regarding uh, COVID on campus and all the, the details of, around uh, departure testing that, that Dr. Harmon mentioned. I just, I wanna try to keep my comments brief because I know we do have questions and just wanna recognize really how difficult this year has been and acknowledge that the months ahead are also gonna be challenging and it's challenging for different reasons, for different families, for different students. And while we are squarely focused on COVID and we have to be, we can't forget about overall well-being. Uh, I will just say I'm, I'm an infectious disease physician at Michigan Medicine, and uh, I uh, am really concerned about where we have gone in the last month as a, as a nation and really around the world. 
I had been you know, more and less optimistic during, uh, during the last eight months. And uh, right now I, I feel like we're, we're entering a, a difficult period of time. So uh, the, you know, the decisions put forth are really based on what the circumstances are. And you know, this gets at the fact that the pandemic has really meant difficult choices and frankly, imperfect choices. You know, sort of picking between really bad options. And uh, this has been very disruptive to many of the students, uh, to the students and families, this is unfair. But uh, unfortunately, this is where we are and there's not an easy end in, in sight. So we have to continue to work together. You know, I, in, in my own family, and again, you heard, I'm, I'm also a parent. Uh, my son is a third year student here. Uh, we talk a lot about just making good decisions, protect yourself, those around you, but, but find ways to connect and find ways to, to enjoy yourself and continue schooling. Uh, our community and our students have really shown grit and resilience and patience and kindness. Uh, some of you have written to me and said, you know what, it's not perfect, but I'm really glad that my, my son or daughter is learning independence. But on the flip side, there's also loneliness and anxiety and depression and a lot of stress. Uh, these issues are not new. They have been there, but clearly the pandemic has made it worse and made it more difficult. And again, with this in mind, there will be two midweek single day well-being days scheduled for the winter semester. And as you heard from the provost, this will be February 24th and March 23rd. And this is a time to take a break, time to catch up. It's also a time to maybe engage in some activities on campus and some volunteer efforts so that you do feel like you're part of campus. And I think that's especially so for our first year students who um, haven't had the typical Michigan experience. Um, Many students do use and benefit from our counseling services. And again, these are very student focused. They're really good programs. Wolverine Wellness, they have a wellness coaching program and they've, they've um, certainly uh, seen lots of students who, who um, have worked on these are techniques to, to cope and, and thrive in this difficult environment. CAPS, which is our counseling and psychological services is adding eight additional counselors. And again, all of these programs offer virtual visits and that's not like a simple, way to fix things, but it is at least a way to try to make sense of the disruption. And I think to, um, to come up with ways and techniques to, to, to help. Uh, I wanted to make a plug for the campus recreational sports facilities. These will continue to be available with reduced operations and hours and the regular exercise is essential. Whether you go for a walk outside or you, you um, have some sort of uh, fitness routine, this is uh, something that I would encourage you to encourage your students to do. And finally, this is also important is ask your students whether they got their flu shot. All of them uh, had this included in their health fee. So there are no out-of-pocket costs. Um, the UHS website has details. Uh, this is especially important this year. And we're, we're, we're doing a lot of messaging and many of the students have gotten their flu shots. But what we don't want is an overlapping outbreak of influenza and COVID. You know, and finally, just sort of parent to parent, um, parenting changes for young adults. Uh, but your role as a parent doesn't go away. So thank you. Continue to support your students, help them make good decisions. And I think really encourage them to find ways to engage with a community that's meaningful to them. I think it helps make Michigan more of theirs. And finally, and this is important, remind them eventually, eventually this long tunnel, there's gonna be light at the end and we'll, we'll eventually get through this. Thanks uh, very much, Preeti. I think now we have time uh, actually for some questions. Uh, Preeti, will you moderate the questions? Do you have them yeah, there? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, um, I have a few that I, I uh, will throw out there. And these were some questions that came in uh, ahead of time. Uh, what plans will there be to engage students socially yet safely? And how will students, how will we help students who are feeling isolated, especially during the winter months? And this is specific also to the first year students how are they, how are we helping them to build connections? And you know, maybe I'll start with Martino on that question. Thank you, Dr. Milani. So um, this division of student life, we actually had been working this semester on taking an approach that was a little different than what we took early in the semester. Early in the semester, we were very conservative. We approached it with an abundance of safety. We had to abide by uh, the ordinances that um, limited gatherings and we'll continue to do that. But we're also gonna add some additional creativity. Um, for example, we know it will be cold outside. But we might get lucky and have some days where it's not brutally cold. And we would encourage um, RAs and other student life professionals to have small informal gatherings with students socially distanced, mask on, 
um, just to have check-ins and conversations. We're opening up the lounges, the multicultural lounges and the community spaces in the residence halls to reservation only, which will limit the number of students who are in the uh, spaces at the same time, but also ensure social distancing and mask wearing. And that will allow for programming and engagement. And finally, even within the residence hall community with a single occupancy format, it really provides um, more safety for our staff, our RAs to go in a room and have a conversation because there'll be less people in a little bigger space. So that gives them a little bit more comfort to, uh, to just check in, have conversations and get to know um, their uh, residents. One of the things that we discovered this fall is that many of our RAs didn't really get to know their residents at all. They, in some cases, couldn't really recognize them. And it's, it's because they didn't feel safe. So the more we can increase safety and we can add that with creativity, but continue with an abundance of, of caution. Thanks. I'm, I'm also gonna just make a plug around research and undergraduate research, which is something that is uh, a wonderful part of the educational experience for the students. And so, you know, whether it's co-curricular or curricular, but also to, to think about undergraduate research opportunities and some of this information's there. So one more thing to in, encourage your students uh, to explore. I, I wanna pose a question to, to really all three of you. What are the lessons learned from the fall semesters that will that will be applied to the winter? And again, I know you touched on base on this a little bit, but maybe I'll start with Susan on this question. Sure, thank you. Um, and and uh, there are a lot of lessons that we have learned and that we are learning. So that uh, continues. Um, I did mention some of the ones in the instructional space, which um, you know. Uh, in particular linked to the previous question, which has to do with how we engage our students as well in a world in which so much of what we're doing is done virtually and, and is done remotely. Um, and so those kinds of smaller collaborative activities around instruction that enable our faculty to connect with students really enrich the learning and will continue beyond the, the, the pandemic period. Um, you know, I'll, I'll also say, so there's a lot of things that I mentioned that are relate to how we teach and how we learn and how we help students understand what works well for them and what doesn't. There also are um, a variety of things that we're learning about the interactions between student initiatives, the student clubs, the student activities that we can um, integrate with what we do in our schools and colleges and our uh, units in order, again, to engage with students in new ways and then enrich the ways that they're learning. And so those are some of the things that I would highlight, but there's a wide range of um, important things we're learning that we will apply more aggressively and uh, extensively in the winter and will be with us for a long time to come. I would add that the, as we really focused on providing a safe environment, um, there was a toll on, that placed a toll on students uh, in terms of loneliness and isolation. And so that creativity that I talked about will help us to balance safety along with trying to engage with students so that they can connect with each other and connect with other people. We also found that although we offered a robust set of opportunities in a virtual format, students experience something called Zoom fatigue. When they are on Zoom, online, all the time for their classes and they just don't have the energy or capacity or motivation sometimes to get on Zoom for a fun activity, and no matter how well-being it might be. So those are two important lessons that we learned that we can't rely on virtual, but we have to still keep the community safe at the same time. I think, you know, I, I'd mentioned just a couple of things. One is I've learned that people assess personal risk very differently from one another. There's all different kinds of perspectives. And I'm sure some parents are wondering, you know, why we're sending their students to study at home. Uh, and then other parents are saying, thank you for sending my students to study at home. Uh, our faculty are actually very low risk uh, based on the way the semester has played out. We've had no a disease transmission in the classroom, yet that doesn't mean that people aren't, many people aren't incredibly afraid 
of the illness for their own sake and for the sake of their family. So uh, fear complicates you know, decision-making. It makes it hard to come up with a set of decisions that an entire community can uniformly uh, gather around. Uh, I've also learned you have to approach these very uncertain circumstances with a sense of humility, you know, recognizing that we're gonna make mistakes and we have to be open-minded and try to correct them and do the best as we can moving forward. And there are no decisions that everyone will support and there are no perfect decisions. These are very novel and difficult circumstances. Uh, on a very practical level, um, in hindsight, I wish our university had found a way to develop more robust uh, levels of testing earlier in the pandemic. And as you all remember, testing has been a problem and remains a problem all around the United States. Uh, there are a couple of universities that got major allocations of funding from their state, like Illinois, and developed ways to do massive amounts of testing. But it's interesting, the first couple of weeks of the semester, Illinois had thousands of cases, despite the fact they were testing everybody twice a week. And they actually had to do one of those two week shutdowns. And now later in the semester, their levels of cases are extremely low. And around the country, we're all learning from that experience. Here at Michigan, we were doing testing for anyone with symptoms and anyone with close contacts. And we were doing statistical surveillance to figure out where the disease was, but we weren't doing thousands and thousands of asymptomatic tests. Uh, our first few weeks, we had very few cases. And then as the semester's gone on, we've had much, much larger numbers of cases and we've managed to grow our testing capacity. So these are all lessons learned uh, that we'll be able to use uh, in the uh, months ahead uh, and try to uh, maintain as good an educational and a safe an experience for our students as we can. Thanks for those comments. I think it reflects the fact that with COVID, we're really like driving on the road as we're building it. And again, in, uh, in the fall, we really weren't in a position to do the kind of testing we are doing now. And, and again, I say it every time, testing isn't the same as prevention, but we've seen how it can be very beneficial, um, not just from a public health standpoint, but from also from an emotional standpoint for folks. So uh, Mark, a couple more questions for you. One is on, um, on graduation and what the plans are around commencement. Yeah, you know, we, we don't have definitive plans yet, but you know, if I had to make an early prognostication, it's hard to imagine putting 60,000 people in the big house uh, in uh, late spring, in, in April or the beginning of May. Uh, uh, we'll make an announcement as soon as you know, we can determine the likelihood, um, uh, but I'm sanguine about the opportunity to have an in-person graduation. Uh, we'll do something significant to mark the occasion. Uh, we did a very nice virtual ceremony uh, last spring uh, and we promise students, if we are unable to have uh, a graduation in person, we'll invite them back to campus down the road, those who graduate, and have a great celebration here in Ann Arbor when you can come back with your families, then we can do so safely and we'll plan things uh, that are really um, special. No one else will have had your graduation uh, by the time we uh, are past uh, the pandemic. So that's the, the best that I could say uh, for right now. Uh, kind of on that note, too, I want to ask one more question of you, which is, can you discuss how you would approach a COVID-19 vaccine for our students? Yeah, so first to give you know, people a sense of timing, uh, I think it's quite likely that there'll be one or several approved vaccines, I'm guessing probably early in the new year, uh, but uh, the government, the federal government is going to determine uh, the order of who gets it when. So I believe they're going to buy up all the doses and then distribute them. Uh, so it's likely that the uh, first folks vaccinated will be uh, frontline healthcare workers, um, uh, public safety people, people that are engaging directly with the public to keep uh, our society moving along. Uh, then it'll go to people who are in various risk groups, uh, perhaps uh, people in nursing homes, people uh, in, in incarceration, you know, situations of that nature, uh, people with predisposing conditions. And then it'll come to the rest of us. Uh, so the university uh, is making plans for how to go ahead and uh, prioritize and inoculate as many people as quickly as we can once we get a supply. Uh, I don't think it's going to have an effect on how we run the campus until at least the fall semester of next year. Uh, just think of the logistical problem. 300 million people or more have to be vaccinated and they need two doses. It's a complicated thing in a country our size and, and, and we don't have a great track record for national level logistics. 
so um, uh, I'm hoping that next fall starts to become a normal semester, but that things will get better between now and then uh, as the disease comes under better control and there are, are better treatments to help people who do become infected become less ill. Thanks. I, I agree with, with your take on, on the vaccine as well. Uh, this is a question for, for uh, Provost Collins. Given the stresses students have been experiencing related to COVID, will they have the option of choosing pass-fail versus a letter grade this semester and also with the upcoming semester? Um, so that's a, that's a question that um, we're being asked and that we're reviewing. I, I did wanna uh, just share with the group um, how we've approached grading. Uh, so prior to the start of the academic year, we carefully considered what the different options were. We did a special option last, uh, last winter. And this summer we took into account the complexities and what our experience was with, uh, with that uh, grading system and recognized that we anticipated that there were a lot of uncertainties and were likely to be some uh, complexities for the, the fall semester. And so what we have in place that we started the semester with this fall was that all undergraduate courses are using a modified version of a traditional grading system where the regular A, B, and C grades are maintained, but students who earn a D or an E will receive a no record COVID grade. And those grades, students can request to have converted into a letter grade, but if they're not converted, then they would not impact the student's GPA. Um, so again, our students have asked us to review that and, and that review is underway. Thank you. I know we're approaching sort of the end of our time and I, there are a lot of questions in the Q&A and we'll get those together and get some of those responses back to folks. But I could turn it back over to President Schlissel to close things out. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I just wanna thank again, all the parents and perhaps students that are listening in today, uh, apologize. You know, the pandemic isn't the fault of the University of Michigan. Uh, it's not the fault of the United States, et cetera. It's a pandemic. Uh, I believe that everybody is trying their best to stay uh, safe and healthy themselves and to protect the safety and healthy of others. And we're trying our best to keep as the mission of the university uh, moving forward uh, to the benefit of society the very best way we can. Uh, so working together, uh, uh, focusing on what we can do to help one another and to help our students, uh, I think is the way we can all contribute to seeing us through to the other side. Uh, so thanks for your patience and forbearance. Uh, we will uh, collect the questions, the myriad of questions we weren't able to get to and find the proper place up on our website to post them so we can get answers to you as we continue to work together uh, to see uh, us safely through the pandemic. Uh, have a, a very good Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, be safe, be healthy. Uh, thank you once again for entrusting us with your, your students uh, and have a good parents weekend as virtual as it may be. Thank you very much.